Even so, every good tree bears what? But a bad tree bears? A good tree cannot bear bad fruit. Nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is what? It's cut down and thrown into the fire. There is a day that we're growing, and sometimes we make mistakes in sin. This is not what it's talking about. But the Bible is describing that there must be a real change. There must be a real change. Because a bad tree can't bear good fruit. Time is an amazing thing. Time is a revealer of the hearts and minds of man. You can only put a show on for so long. You'll be found out. Your habits can only be suppressed in front of people for so long. Who are we for real? What do we really believe? How do we really live when no one is looking? What really is going on inside of us? Bad trees are not going to heaven. Bad trees are not going to heaven. Salvation means he takes a bad tree and he kills it and he makes a brand new tree. The brand new tree goes to heaven. You can put ornaments on a bad tree. You can dress up a bad tree. You can make a bad tree look like a good tree, but it's a bad tree. And it will not be able to produce the works of God. You see, a good tree is going to produce the fruit of God, but a bad tree can't produce the works of God. Look what it says, verse 20. Therefore, by their fruits you will know them. By their fruits you will know them. All right, look. Remember that lordship thing? This is now, I just wanted to read continually here. Verse 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Just stop right there. What? I was taught that if I confess Jesus as Lord, that I'm going to go to heaven. Jesus just said, Jesus, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, is going to heaven. Oh my gosh. So if you ever heard, if you confess Jesus as Lord and you're going to definitely go to heaven, not true. Not true. Man, I could feel the uncomfortableness in the room. It's like, is somebody turning the heat on? Something. But I told you, most people don't read the Bible. So Satan gets you living in things that are similar to the Bible, but not the Bible. Do you know what would happen if you were in the water and you were dying and the rescue swimmer came and the guy actually can't swim? He goes, oh, I just tried on their clothes. You're going to go down with that person because they don't have the ability to rescue you. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. Guys, we've got to find out who does go. Do you want to know that? Because I don't know if you're all headed there. I'm not your judge. I don't know what he knows. I don't know, but I want to make sure that on my watch that no one who hears me preach will fall into a situation where they're like, you never told me, Pastor. America looks Christian. America is not Christian. It's a post-Christian era. Look at the adversity that comes against the politicians who stand for Christ. Look at the adversity that comes against the college professors who begin to speak of the Bible. Look at what happens to them. They get blacklisted. Look at the people in law. Look even in business. You follow good business Christian ethics. People that say, no, you can't stay in business. You got to do deals the way that you do deals because the world doesn't work that way. You're in America. They're following bad tree, bad roots. Why is it so hard to live a Christian life in a Christian nation? Because the nation isn't Christian. Now, it doesn't mean we don't have Christians in politics and in government. It doesn't mean that we don't have Christians in places. It doesn't mean that in pockets of things. I'm talking about the culture. Look at TV. 
what would that show? I love Lucy. They didn't even sleep in the same beds. They would not dare put that on TV. They were married. Everything shifted so much. Everything shifted so much. And now what we think is Christian is not necessarily Christian. So I want to tell you that carbon monoxide poisoning happening in the church, happening in theology, has anesthetized people. I said it right the first time. Now I'm not going to try to say it again. But it's putting people into a slumber, into a stupor, into a, huh, anyway, let me turn the TV on. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. What'd you say? It's getting scary. You can go to a bus stop and nobody talks to one another anymore. It's happening. The end days, what was prophesied is happening. Paul said to Timothy, beware in the last days they're going to find preaching that tickle their ears. They're going to look for preachers that will say the thing that they want to hear. Guys, I've been to other countries before, and I want to tell this to you, and I'm saying this not against you or an indictment against any one of you. But I have walked through nations, some countries, and I walk through the streets, and I go to the churches, and I preach at the different churches. And I am not a little shocked. I am blown away of their fear and honor to the Lord. And they don't have anything. I mean, I've been to some churches that have such beautiful things. You thought you were in Manhattan overseas. And then I've been in some that were literally built out of pallet wood. And it doesn't even have like, they call it a wall. But it's really not a wall. But the love and the fear and the honor and the service. I don't know what happened after the summer. And again, I don't want to beat anybody over the head. But why are you coming so late? You don't do that at work. You wouldn't dare do that at work. And if a friend is late for whatever you're waiting for, if your Uber driver is late, you're all in a tiff. What's happening? What's happening? That's Jesus. Did you forget? He bled for you. He bled for you. It's not easy to get to heaven. Okay, I said it. I said it. God said it was easier for a rich man to go through the eye of a needle than it was for a rich man to get to heaven. Did Jesus say it was easy? He said the way was narrow and difficult. <sighs> Do you know something scary? God is God. He's put everything in his word, and he's put everything, and everything's done, and he's given open, open heaven to everybody. He's tore the curtain between the top to the bottom. He said, anybody can come into my Shekinah, and now what's happening on the earth, he's proving your heart. Your heart, from the time you got saved, or the time that, no, no, let me not say that, from the time you heard about Jesus... I'm not going to talk about the salvation. From the time you heard about Jesus to now, check out how much hunger have you had in the Word. How many times did you read the whole Bible? How many hours a day or anything in prayer? Most of your whole life, I should read the Bible. You didn't understand. You missed it. It's gone. You proved your heart. You don't want Him. When you come late, sometimes stuff happens, so please don't get offended. Okay? You feel good? You get it out? That actually hurt. <laughs> that actually hurt. I hit myself too hard. I felt that one. I think that's going to leave a mark. I don't know how much because if I really spoke, I don't know if you could handle it. Because we are dishonoring God every single day. All, all the time, we're dishonoring God. 
He doesn't fit our schedule. Find that in the Bible. Find that in the Bible. Oh, well, we don't like to give. We don't believe in tithing. What do you believe in? You don't believe in 10%. But yet in the Old Testament, a woman who didn't have anything, she had a little bit of, of flour, a little, little, bit of, little bit of oil, and she said, I'm going to go make the prophet the cakes. Me and my son are going to go die. Do you see the devotion of the woman? Do you see the honor of another servant of God? She honored Elijah. She honored the man of God. She said, that's an honor. That's a, I'm going to give him honor, but I know I may die. My own son may die. God said, wait till you watch what I do with her. And he filled it up and filled it up and filled it up and filled it up. And in the midst of a famine, she never went. What about the woman who said, oh, that's a man of God. Husband, we're going to make a place for him to stay. We're going to make a place for him. Do you say? Do you know that her son got healed because she made room? Her son was brought back from the dead because she made room. I'm telling you guys, the world is working on you. Satan is working on you to push God out of everything. And then here's the carbon monoxide. Yeah, I'm, I'm doing good. And then you die and you didn't smell it and you didn't hear it. And you didn't taste it, but it killed you. Because true salvation means that at every turn, at every moment, in your heart, you bend your knee to Jesus' lordship. If Jesus is not your Lord, if he's your Savior, he's not your Lord, I, I don't know if he's your Savior. I don't know if he's your Savior. Oh, I want him to heal me. Amen. He wants to heal you. But we don't want lordship. You want lordship? Come before his throne. It's going to ratify you. No, you will not be able to watch. I will not be able to watch. We cannot watch what the world watches. Paul said to Corinth, a sexually immoral city, come, and he quoted the Old Testament, come out from among them. Be ye separate from among them. Guys, the average Christian has one foot in the world and one foot in Christ. And actually, I don't know how you're saved that way. You didn't see the cross. You, you, you didn't see it. Jesus didn't keep any of his life. Not one ounce of his life did Jesus keep. We're being duped. We're being duped because the standard and God in prayer is putting this on my heart because I don't want anyone to die. I don't want anyone to die because whatever happened from this point on can change. And God can even restore the years that the locusts have eaten. He can do more in the next 12 months than he's done in the last 20 years. That is God and that is his mercy. But if there is not a change, you're only proving your heart. Coming late to worship, something happened. Over a period of time, you're like, well, that's the optional part. Do you know that we're in church longer than most churches? I think you know that. <laughs> Actually, you're wrong. You only compared us to other churches in the Western world of America. Actually, come to Africa with me. Come to Indonesia. Come to Cambodia. leave church. Come to China. You will wonder if you are saved by only listening to them pray. They pray. You're like, what is that? We were walking up in Africa and Ghana. We were walking up a staircase and the place feels like it's shaking. And service was was not going on, but there were still a lot of people. This is a massive place we were in. Their choir was bigger than our whole congregation. What is that rumbling? Ah, oh, those are the interns. What are they doing? They live in the prayer tower. They're not allowed to do anything until they learn to pray. And it was a rumbling loud. The place was shaking and they were the interns. Yeah. 
this is us. Why did God do this? Why? 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 Oh, my gosh. I'm not making fun of you. I've been there too. But at his throne, you don't ask why. You're consumed with his goodness. And revelation starts to come. And your question in the presence of, Lord, why did this happen, is one of I'm seeking understanding versus the complaint and the murmur against God. Two people can ask why. One is beautiful. One is not. Hi. You okay? i got to go back to this text because I've got to be able to put truth. Not everyone says to me, Lord, Lord, shall I enter the kingdom of God. What was the problem with them? He said, have we not prophesied in your name? What? Cast out demons in your name? And done many wonders in your name? Do you hear their question? But we were in ministry. Read it again. I don't, I don't know if we got this. Have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Do you see their question? Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does what? The will of my Father in heaven. Listen to what they said. Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord. Jesus is saying in that day, they're going to say, Lord. They're going to call me Lord. They're going to they're be confused. They're not going to understand. They're going to be absolutely bewildered. He says, only he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Don't worry. I'm not teaching a workspace salvation. We're saved by grace. But that grace does a work which produces a work. They say, have we not prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and done many wonders in your name? Do you hear a constant? It was in your name, in your name, in your name. Brothers and sisters, don't be misunderstood. The word of God, God does not need you for his name to be powerful. God does not need you for his name to operate. God's name is God's name. Demons bow down to his name. They don't bow down to a human being. So they're confused. Listen to what Jesus says. And then I will declare to them, I never knew you. I what? This is not speaking about somebody who was saved and made mistakes. This is not speaking about I really received Jesus and really received him as Lord and I fell down in sin. I made mistakes. It's not talking about that. Jesus said, I never knew you. But they think they're okay. They're not okay. It's too late for them. I never knew you, I believe means you never partook of me. You never received salvation. You never met the condition for me to save your life. You were busy doing for others, but you did in my name, but you yourself never took care for your own life. Oh, guys, I never knew you. Brothers and sisters, I'm telling you, you must test everything I say. Don't believe me for because you like me. 
test everything I say with the word of God. Amen? That's what the Bible says your job is. But now I'm going to say this, so I'm putting myself right in it. Do not think that because somebody got ordained, because somebody got put in a pulpit, that they're not in witchcraft, they're not doing bad things, and don't even, don't even doubt for a minute that they're not even saved. There are preachers now telling people that there's no hell. They're saying that Jesus was not this and Jesus was not that. If you do not understand the supremacy of Jesus, if you do not understand the real way to be saved, you may fall into this category and God say, I never knew you. Yeah, just say a little prayer. Where is that little prayer? There's principles of the prayer in the Word of God. Praise God. Guys, this is so serious. Lord, may not this ever happen to any of us. But you know that people don't know the end. That any one of us can go out... What you even do with this word right now may determine your forever, 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 forever. And I feel the Spirit of God upon me before this message of saying, tell them, warn them, help them, bring the message to the world. Everything isn't okay. And by the way, sometimes we're Christians that go through things and victory doesn't come right away. Can I get an Amen. But victory comes. Can I get an amen? amen? But a lot of people in the whole entire body of Christ, the, the majority of the body of Christ is sick, stressed, fearful, upset, and disobedient. Without victory. Did you know that you really need Jesus in order to get victory? Did you know that in order for him to be your savior, you have to have him? Now you must be wondering. Are you saying that this one's saved and that one's not? I am not saying that. I'm not touching that. I'm not even going to touch you. As I'm preaching, God knows. It's not like I'm like, oh, Margie. Oh, <laughs> oh Jay's laughed. I'm laughing that. I'm good, you know. No, I'm not thinking like that. It's more of a declaration. I'm like a mailman. Really, they have a good job. They have a good job. We're going to pretend that this is an envelope. And my job, take it from the sender and give it to the receiver. Don't mess with the message. If a mailman message, messes, messes with my mail, he's going to hear it. Right? How do you think Almighty God feels with preachers? You're okay, you're okay, you're okay, you're okay. Meanwhile, where is the repentance to the degree that Jesus become Lord to such a degree that we're in fear of sinning? Usually we're like, oh yeah, that's, you know, yeah, God knows. You are spiritually unhealthy if that's you. Man from Africa uh, died, was embalmed, came back to life. They, they brought it, all documented, and brought it back to life. And this stuff happens, like, frequently, then we, they don't put it in the news. Oh, if it was a Christian nation, how they would report on it. People say, you know, what are you, I'm Christian, right? And they're saying, I don't know. That's what you said about yourself. I don't know God's testimony of you. The Bible says the Spirit of God bears witness of who is who. So there are times in which I meet somebody, I'm like, oh, my goodness, my brother, my sister. But many, many, many times people say they're Christian. I think it's a political orientation, not actually deep salvation. This man came back to life in Africa. Do you know what he said? He said it was so beautiful, he didn't want to leave, you know. But he said, now I'm on earth, I'm afraid to sin because now I saw. The Bible says that evil company corrupts good habits. What would happen if usually we're saturated with evil in this nation? (sighs) 
All right, let me keep going. Then I will declare to them, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. How much lawlessness do you need and how frequently do you need it to practice it? Now, I'm not saying that we're saved by good deeds. We're not. Nobody can get to heaven by our own works. But if Paul said in his faith uh, in Galatians 2.20, therefore I have been crucified with Christ, it is no longer I who live, but Jesus who lives in me, where's the change? Everybody's too busy, and the Bible speaks of it. Did you read about the marriage? Did you read about it? Did you read that they were invited to the marriage and they said, oh, sir, I'm sorry, I have uh, a business. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, I'm getting married. Oh, I'm sorry, sir, I've just bought land. Oh, I'm sorry, sir. And they didn't make it to the marriage feast. If I were you, I'd be very, very scared to say you're too busy. I'd be very nervous to say in your life that you're too busy. Now, please, guys, I keep giving you disclaimers because I don't want you to take it to something that I don't mean. I don't mean that there's a prayer night and you have something to do that if you say you're too busy, you're falling into this category. I'm not saying that. Can I get an amen? amen. I don't want you to, oh, my gosh, pastor's going to think, oh, my gosh, am I one of those? I missed Sunday service. Am I going to go to hell? No. We're speaking about a deeper place, the heart, the heart, the heart. Can you say the heart? heart. Here, let me give you a description. There are some people who have that busy thing, like, oh, thank God I don't have to go to the prayer meeting then. And then there are other people going, oh, God, I want to be at the prayer meeting, but I'm not there. Same situation, but different heart. Listen, I'll, I'm sharing this message with fear myself because when you start spending time in the heart of the Father, it says that in, in, in 1 Peter, that He doesn't desire that any would perish. The heart of our Father is that He doesn't want one person to go to hell. He doesn't want one person to go to hell. Isn't that good news? But just because He doesn't want them to, I'm still thinking about, but most people do, which I then therefore understand, oh my goodness, it's not, it's not about God preventing them, it's about us. Turn with me to Romans chapter 10, and let's look at the Bible again, and let's look at the verse that is so frequently misquoted. Romans chapter 10, and we're going to look here in verse 9, and this is what the Bible says, not what the religion watered down message says. You know the thing, well, if you believe, if you confess Jesus as Lord, you're saved, and I just showed you in the text that it said Jesus did not say that everyone who confesses me is saved. Did you get that? We're now going to look at the accurate scripture of why people say that whoever confesses, but we're going to read the whole verse. Can somebody say amen? amen? All right, here's the verse, verse 9, that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, the what? Lord. Lord. What, what is it? Lord. Lord. It's not using the term Savior, is it? If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and, everybody say, and. and. Say it again. And. This is the part that's left out. And as soon as you leave something out from the Scripture and quote the Scripture, it's not the Scripture. Everybody say, and. and. Believe, go ahead. Believe. In your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. It does not say that if everybody confesses with their mouth that they're saved. It says if you confess with your mouth out of the abundance of the heart. In other words, and you believe in your heart. Believe what? This is another part that gets left out. Let's read it. 
and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. What? Do you remember what I shared last week with all the statistics from the Barna Research Group? This is very specific, isn't it? That you confess Jesus as Lord and you believe in your heart that Jesus existed? No. That Jesus was a historical figure? No. That he was a moral teacher? No. That he was a prophet? No. That you believe that he accomplished what God sent him to do. When it says that you believe that God raised him from the dead, it's not just that you believe in the resurrection. It is that you believe in the entirety of the person and work of Jesus. If you understand and we unpack this verse with the rest of Paul's letters and the four historical gospels and the rest of the 39 books of the Bible, you're going to get a story that the whole Bible is about Jesus. It's revealing who he is and what he's done. And there are so many in the church, as I went through the statistics last week, that are saying Jesus is this and he's that. And they're missing him because the revelation of Jesus is narrow and it's difficult because you find him even even somebody has a gun to your head you must confess him as lord and you can only do that with a gun with a trigger on the on the on the, the finger on the trigger if you believe in the heart that god raised him from the dead because then you know he's the first fruits and if i die i can't die i'm just going to be promoted right here the best your trigger can do is promote me why because i believe in my heart that he's lord now, why is it you got trouble at work confessing him, Lord? And you're not even going to die. Maybe you're going to lose your job. Lose the darn job. Oh, but pastor, are you telling me to be radical? No, the blood is radical. The blood of Jesus is speaking. And no matter what it is in your life, if it is not under the Lordship, get rid of it. Crucify it. Because he's coming back. He'll give you a new job. But you don't believe. But you say you do, but you don't believe. You believe that the job is your provider. You believe that the job is your security. You don't really believe Jesus is Lord. Oh, but it's so practical. Brothers and sisters, that context of Romans chapter 10, verse 9, confess him as Lord, must be understood in this modern generation. Back then, they're in Rome. This is a letter to the Romans. And during that time, praise God, during that time, Paul said, you got to say it. You got to say what you believe. You got to confess your faith in your heart. He, he was saying it's not even enough just to say, well, I'm going to be one of those secret Christians. He said, You got to declare. You got to stand for his lordship because if the heart is real, the mouth can do nothing but speak it. You okay? All right. Nobody threw anything at me yet. This is going pretty, pretty good. Back then, you know what would happen? It was Rome. Letters to the Romans. You know what the Romans did? Let me tell you. They take you away from your family. Doesn't matter how many kids you have. They would imprison you. They would beat you. And they would routinely kill you. When Paul back then said you must confess the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart, he was saying you got to give your whole life into the trust of Almighty God. Because it cost them everything to obey, verse 9. Everything. All right, let me, let me share this now. Ready? 2018, everybody can confess he's Lord. And it costs them nothing. Tougher to tell who's who. Tougher to tell who is who. Oh, Jesus is Lord, I love him, but your life does not prove it. You have words. Wouldn't want to die like that. 
I wouldn't want to die like that. James said, you say, you say, you say you have faith, but you have not worked. Your faith is dead. Is it able to save you? That, that, you got to read the Bible. Oh, I believe. Oh, I believe. Yeah, I believe. I believe. I believe. There are times that a pastor has to go leave the 99 and go for the one sheet because stuff happens, so praise God. But let me tell you, it is not a pastor's job to call everybody every single week to get your butt here. That is a deformation of a pastoral calling. My job isn't even to feed you. My job is to lead you to the pastures. Did you ever see a, pa did you ever see a shepherd putting the grass up to the mouth? Did you ever see a shepherd say, oh, hold on, hold on, open up your mouth, hold on, hold on, I got to force feed you? Something's wrong. Some places I go, and I remember the first time I preached. I preached, I sat down and said, what just happened? I'm the same guy. Why did that happen? But home, it's tough to move. The people don't move, but what? Oh, I understand. Same seed, same word, same work and process, different ground. I believe judgment's going to end like this. What did you do with Jesus? Guys, I got to go to just someplace else. Go with me to the Gospel of John. Let me show you this in action. Let me show you this in action, the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. The Gospel of John. Chapter 20. Here we go. Look, in verse 18, Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. What'd she say? He's alive. Then the same day at evening, being the first day of the week when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, Jews came and stood in the midst and said to them, I mean, Jesus came and stood in the midst and said to them, peace be with you. I love that Jesus walks in rooms with the doors closed. <laughs> it's so good, isn't it? Yeah. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Isn't he graceful? Gracious? Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Oh, Jesus. Hallelujah. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. You got it? All right. So Tommy missed that encounter. He, he, he wasn't there. He, he, he didn't get to see the hands and feet of Jesus. He, 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 he missed it. He, he, he wasn't there to hear, and he didn't have the Holy Spirit breathed on him. Guys, don't miss meetings. You don't know what God's going to do when God's going to do it. Verse 24, now Thomas called the twin one of the twelve. Everybody say one of the twelve. Say it again. One more time was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, we have seen the Lord. So he said to them, unless I see his hands, the print of the nails, and put my finger into the print of the nails, and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. What did he not believe? Did he not believe in Jesus? No, he believed in Jesus. He was one of the 12. Oh, he wasn't Judas. Judas rejected, G he, 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 he uh, betrayed Jesus. Thomas didn't betray Jesus. You don't hear Thomas as listed as like Judas, do you? No. But, but listen to what happened. He said, I will not believe. Believe what? The resurrection. The victory of Jesus over sin, over death. Romans chapter 10, verse 9, the Apostle Paul says, If you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Somebody say amen. amen. Thomas doesn't believe the thing he needs to believe to be saved. 
He believed Jesus. Could you imagine the preaching circuit that, that Thomas would have in 2018? If somehow we had Thomas here, everybody would want to book Thomas. I wouldn't want Thomas in the pulpit, not in that condition. But something else happened, didn't it? Something very specific happened. Verse 26, and after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas was with them. Jesus came, there it is again, to the doors being shut. I just love that. <laughs> it's so good. The grace of God. What does he do? He already went. He already breathed on the Holy Spirit. He already did it, but Tommy wasn't there. And Tommy says, I'm not going to believe in the thing I need to believe in to be saved unless I get to do this. And the door shut again, and there he is. Grace and truth are in the room. And stood in the midst and said, peace to you. Verse 27, then he said to Thomas, what did he do? He said to everybody, peace to you. And then he zeroes in on Tommy. Right? He zeroes in on Tommy. He doesn't address the other ones. Why? They're okay. But he goes after the one that isn't okay. It's not God's will that one should perish. But do you see how heaven is making sure to give opportunity to the, to the human being who needs to have real, authentic conversion? It's like he's God, right? But he's got time to see Tommy. Now, everybody would say Tommy's okay. But Jesus knows differently. Grace knows differently. He wants to bring Thomas into an encounter with what? The whole truth. That's what he said. Then he said to Thomas, reach your finger here. Ah. Oh. He's so good. He's so good. Why are preachers and churches and Christianity making it so casual to be saved? But Jesus comes back and he said, you said that you won't believe unless you put your feet and you touch and you put it aside. I don't want you to die, Thomas. So he says, reach your finger here. And look at my hand and reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. He was one of twelve, but he was not ready. Are you? Are you ready? Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. It was in his hand and it was in his side that he met something. Not just someone. He met the supremacy of Jesus. He came to the point that there is no other. My, you are the way. Jesus said in John 14, 6. Let me go there. And then we're going to go. Because if I cry too much, it messes up my makeup. Uh, uh, can somebody get a tissue in my office? Rusty or Selena, can you get a tissue? Thank you. Oh, I think I'm going to need tissues ready for this series, so have them every week. Uh, verse 20, no, verse uh, 6. 
14, 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Thank you. No one, no, you hear it? No one comes to the Father except through me. No one. If you did not come to a place in your life where Jesus becomes supreme, where he really becomes Lord, you're in trouble. Is he Lord? How deeply? In what areas? There's a telltale sign about something I want to share before we close. When we become saved, we don't change everything automatically. It, 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 it takes time to become sanctified. We grow into the character of Christ. We grow in strength and wisdom. We get cultivated through the Christian life. Let me say it another way. We really screw a lot of stuff up even after we get saved. <laughs> Look, I got an amen on that one. We are not speaking about if you are not perfect and you do not remain sinless, you are not saved. Don't let the devil speak that to you. Don't let that even enter your head. But I'm going to tell you something. For those who really are saved, when you sin, you hate it. When you sin and you're not connected, you're not right. You don't feel, it's not right with me and God. I didn't get to talk. You don't pray, you know I got to get back to prayer. You don't read the Bible, I got to get into the Word. There's, there's a witness. There's something in you that's moving you to repentance, moving you to, moving you to holiness, moving you to. Amen? You are, are you here? You may not be perfect, but you're His. But you change when you get convicted. Do not rely on grace as an excuse for sin. Some people have a big problem with me preaching like this because they said, well, you're not a grace preacher at all. You're a works preacher. No. I'm preaching the intensity of grace. We're all criminals, guys. Let's be humble. We're not polished, nice, wonderful, righteous people. We're ex-cons in the law of God. For all have, fall, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Romans 3.23. But I've been saved. I've been changed. I've been made new. I'm not who I was. But I still act like my old self sometimes. Some of you know it. All right, you didn't have to laugh. But some of you have seen me in my flesh. You've seen me get angry. You've seen me. And God sees every element of me that I have fallen down. My wife sees it. My children see it. Sometimes we act like the person we were, but we're not that person. There's a huge difference between acting like a fallen person while you are a child of God versus acting like a child of God. 
when indeed you are still just falling. And the devil has so many counterfeits. So the only way you can work this out is on your knees between you and Jesus. And if you know you have sin, change. Run to him. God, I agree with you. That is not what a child of God should do, act, think, speak, or move. God, I'm going to do it like this. For those who are endeavoring to be in leadership here, it's not about being perfect, but it is about being sold out. Amen? Now, we need rest, and we need breaks, and we need balance in life, but there's still that element of I'm sold out for Jesus. Parents, you got to bring your kids. you got to bring your youth. You, you, you have to bring them. 24-7, they're in the world. And then a lot of parents are like, yeah, well, they didn't make it to youth. No, 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 no. You, I don't think you understand. It's your primary number one responsibility as a parent to bring them up in the ways of the Lord. Now, I'm going to say something that's really, 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 really not going to be nice. No, I mean, oh, I don't know if I should say it. No, baby, I need wisdom on this one. No. It's not necessary. No, no. If it was truth, I'd say it's, it's something that's not necessary to be said. Parents, there's a witness that comes from your spiritual leadership that's reflected in your children. I'm saying it this way. Don't blame the world for how your kids are. I'm going to share this. I'm going to be sending them out again, but I sent out a few studies for accountability for the church to say, here's what we're covering with your children. And I said, moms and dads, here's the questions, here's the study for you to study with your kids at home. Of all the times that I sent them, I get the response back. You know when you get a receipt when the thing's open? Two opens of every email from every parent two opens leaders in training unless you did it another way on your phone or something I got like one or two opens on the Ellie summary notes the testimony of this church must be wow faithful don't worry about being successful be faithful I, I, I didn't say what it, the other thing I was going to say because not necessary, but I, I, I am going to say that because it's a matter of like we're in this together. We're not here to throw stones, okay? Amen? Amen. I have no intention of upsetting anybody. Trust me because I'm the one that has to go home and be like, oh, God, was that a faithful message? God, please. But I am shepherding you. We got to do a better job of praying with our kids. We got to do a better job of them seeing us pray and read. My children are not perfect. I'm working on stuff with my own kids. That's why I'm not throwing a stone. But I'd love to be in an environment where I'm praying for yours, you're praying for mine, and we're both doing it. We're both engaged. But how can we even pray about it if we're not even doing what we're supposed to be doing? I'm telling you, i got to do a better job myself. Amen? Amen. But he walked in the room where the doors were shut. So I'm going to just close on this message here. Because I'm going to get myself in some hotter water if I don't. <laughs> God loves you. And God loves me. And it's time to get serious for Jesus. And just because you received something 25, 30 years ago doesn't mean that you're walking according to what you received. So here's my question that I'd ask you to meditate on and think through. Am I walking according to the doctrine by which I received? Am I walking according to the sound doctrine of which I received? First Timothy, I'm going to read this, we're going to go, I know we're going to go on our knees. First Timothy chapter 4, verse 6, he tells Timothy that he was, that he has carefully followed the good doctrine. And in verse 16, this is what Paul says to his spiritual son, Timothy. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. It means the teaching. 
continue in them. For in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. Continue in it. Amen? If anything got you out, come back. Praise God. And the Bible says that there's joy in heaven is thrown. Angels rejoice when even one sinner repents. But this call is to you who may not know Jesus the way Thomas needed to know Jesus and you who may be Christian and somewhere along the line you got lukewarm. Somewhere along the line you're like, well, everybody else is like that. But let God's will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Does that sound good? Day and night and night and day they're before God. I wish I could have a penny for your thoughts right now. But the next few weeks, we're going to be learning about who is he? Who is he? Because there's no one like them. And my prayer in the next few weeks, I'm going to teach the supremacy of Jesus. Part three coming next week. I couldn't even get into his uniqueness yet. This entire message. Let me just say, I, I had 26 pages plus of preparation. And I didn't even get to it. Because when I was in my office this morning, I came across John chapter 20. And I felt like the Spirit of God say, I want you to preach on that. Now I understand why. Because I believe the Spirit of God has created a wineskin that says if we do not understand who He is, we may never pass from death to life. You won't. And if you don't know that He's better than Buddha, if you don't know that better than Muhammad, if you don't know that he's better than Krishna, because on the earth today, people believe in Jesus, but they say he was one of the prophets. Read Matthew chapter 16. Jesus said, who do men say that I am? And, and they said, some say you are Elias, and some say that you are Jeremiah, and one of the prophets. Well, so do Muslims say he's one of the prophets. Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said, Simon Bar, blessed are you, Simon Bar Jonah, for flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. You want salvation? Put your hand up. If you want to be saved, you want to be saved. You want to be saved. Come on, put it up. Why? Some people put it down. Still not participating. All right, forget it. All right, keep your hands down. Read the Bible. It says lift holy hands. Jeez, I know I'm offending people left and right. I'm just figuring out how I offend everybody, I think. Lift your hands, church. You should tell the devil, my hands are up. I'm not going to hell. Show the whole world, I care about my eternity. Show the whole world that being saved is more important than being healed physically, more important than your money, more important than anything else who's in that hour. The only thing that's going to matter is who you know. And if you really know Jesus, and if you don't really know him, you are not ready to die. So whatever flesh and blood taught you, it's not good enough. It's the Father through his Holy Spirit. So we're going to pray right now. Father, show us Jesus. Father, show us Jesus. Father, show us Jesus. Open my eyes. If you've never asked Jesus into your heart, you could do it right now. 
And you can tell him, Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I have broken your law. I know that I'm unworthy. But God, I believe that Jesus is the sacrifice for sin. I believe that I need Jesus because he's the only son of God. He's the only one that was sinless. He's the only one that defeated the devil. He's the only one that could save me. I reject every other philosophy. I reject everything the world has to offer and all its gospel counterfeits. And I receive the true and unadulterated gospel that it is by faith in you that we confess that you are Lord, that you are Lord of all. Father, we pray now, God, save, save God. Lord, hear the hearts of the people who are crying out. God, hear their cry. I know you hear their cry and answer them. Show up in their room. Show up in their room. Show up in their cube. Show up in their cars. And let there be a revelation that comes from the Father once again. That we'll see Jesus from heaven down, not from the earth up. God, restore the understanding of who the Son of God is. That there is no, no, no counterfeit. That all philosophies of men are dung. It's death. There's no value in it. Deliver Muslims, God. Deliver them from trusting a man who did not overcome death. Deliver the Buddhists from a philosophy not able to save their life. Oh God, if there was no re resurrection, then it doesn't matter. But God, there is. And you alone, you alone have overcome death. And God, I intercede for those who are about to die. For those, Lord, who death is coming for it. It's everyone. But it shall have no victory over them that are in you. And so, Lord, we pray for abundant grace. We pray for all those in the every house ministry and every church and every nation and every city. God, that there will be a revelation of you. Lord, I know you're extending your nail-scarred hands. You're extending your side to the nations. And you're saying, put your hand in my side. So we pray, God, that we will not be cold-hearted. That the deceitfulness of sin will not harden our hearts, God. But God, that we will come to you and we will fall before you. And that we will receive you as Lord. And everybody now who receives him deeply in your heart as Lord, you may be fouled up, you may be messed up, you may be on drugs, you may be prostituting, you may be lying, you may be committing adultery, but it doesn't matter because when you come to him for real, He'll change you from the inside out. Just come to him. Come to Jesus. Come to him. Come to the king. And when you call on him like that, he will save your life. He will make you new. He will make you new. He will make you new on the inside out. And he will make you his own. And Lord, for every Christian in this house, and every Christian hearing my voice, beginning with me, may we once again, God, in every way, return back to you as Lord. Whatever it may be. It could be small areas, could be big areas, God, but I'm praying that, Lord, that this church will have a testimony that you're Lord. That you're our first love. Lord, that you're our first love. I ask God, whatever you need to speak to any one of us, speak it. Whatever you need to release, speak it. Whatever we need to repent, God, we pray we'll repent. Lord, but lead and guide us, Father. That, Lord, that you're, that you're released to do what only you could do. I thank you, Lord God, for this message. I pray for boldness, Lord, that I've never had. I pray that I have boldness in the future that I've never had. Lord, and I pray, Father God, that we may rightly divide the word of truth and see the seriousness that it is those who believe in their heart and confess with their mouth and believe that you have achieved resurrection. And we declare now at the end of this message, Jesus, that you alone are Lord. You are unique because you overcame death. Death could not hold you. Oh, death, where is thy sting? Where is thy victory? 
Thank you, God, that you and you alone have overcome the grave. And we come to you laying it all down in Jesus' name. Amen.